Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Electric Underground. I have completely lost track of the episode numbers at this point. Not that it matters, because if I'm, if all goes according to plan, you are listening to this as the secret hidden ending to Shmup Slam 3. And today I have a worthy guest, the awesome, the amazing, the funny, Dambo. Welcome to the podcast. Does this make me the true last boss of Shmup Slam 3? It does indeed. Pearl, you know, he retired. He put it, I asked him, he's like, no, I want to do a legit run this year. And so, yes, now you are the hidden boss of Shmup Slam 3. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> the TLB. Yeah, so I'm the uh, programmer slash designer on Blue Revolver. Obviously, that it wasn't like a one man. It wasn't a one man show by any stretch. We had Wolf, uh, Comic Z, etc., doing the art, um, the music, which was a huge part of it, done by uh, Keygen, as well as you know so many guest artists, musicians. Um, our double action OST by Xemi and Hagani. So there's quite a few people involved in Blue Revolver, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm the guy that didn't balance the shot types good, and the guy <laughs> that will never change that one boss four attack that everyone hates. I'm not going to change it. Sorry. That's what makes you the the final boss. And you know what? I was thinking about this earlier today because I was reading a review that I didn't really agree with of Fight and Rage. And the reviewer, it was on PC Mag. The mm -hmm. reviewer was really mad about the section of Fight and Rage where you're on this raft, essentially. And you're not, you're getting like blitzed by all these enemies in a semi sort of cheap way. And then you can also fall off the raft and die. When I was thinking about that criticism, I thought, well, every great game needs to have some sort of jank section to it that just makes the player infuriated or drives them crazy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, need like that, you need that little section that just is a thorn in your neck and you hate it, but you also respect it. So many, especially arcade games, really benefit from having that one section where it is just so hard. It is like complete bullshit. It's just something you have to just sit down, learn again and again and again. And then like, first time you do it without spending resources etc it's like morpheus from the matrix looking over your shoulder going he's beginning to believe you know? <laughs> so it's yes. like the he the, understands yeah the descent section in ketsui or oh know, my gosh the vulcan trap black hearts vulcan trap and battle garaga you know that sort of thing the turret wall that the game has, that game has two of those. <laughs> so i recently figured out this is a little tangent but i recently figured out in battle Grega. i don't know if other people are doing this if you play Modo in Grega, the second Vulcan sweep, if you're fast enough, you can just get out of the entire thing because Modo is so fast. You can just get up there and start point blanking his head while he does the oh. Vulcan sweep. I'm actually I playing saw... Miyamoto like quite recently in Garaga, and it's like I used to play um, Golden Bat, and it is a breath of fresh air because. I hate Golden Bat. I'm, I'm going to say it right now. Yeah, yeah, I don't like it's... Golden Bat because he's a slow turtle. It's like, okay, this game. It's too fun to play at this slow turtle speed. That's just slow my opinion. Turtle game, you know, you do have piercing shots, which is nice, but you have a bomb, which is like... <laughs> I love the bomb, dude. It's... The flamethrower is the best, though. I'll give is it that. It, I love the, the flamethrower. It the it's best? not the best. It's not the best, but it is the best. Do you know what I mean? I, I love flamethrowers, so maybe that's what it is, but... I don't mind a flamethrower, just... but I mean, that's like a, a can of Lynx Africa or whatever is strapped out lighter. <laughs> What do you call it? Uh, axe? I think Axe in America is what yes. you call that deal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Some aerosol. So a homemade flamethrower is what you're saying. Well, two well, of them, let's be fair. Well, maybe, you know, it fits into the story. The dudes didn't have a lot of money. It didn't sound like they're just kind of throwing shit together. They got their, <laughs> they get their aerosol cans. They put a little light on the end of it. There you go. There's your flamethrower. Yeah, but all the other ships, they fire like a bajillion missiles at a time and they do all sorts <laughs> of shit. I mean, those bombs aren't very good as well. All the non-Maho bombs seem kind of yeah, they all suck. in that game, but yeah, you know, what can you do? What are you doing? That ain't happening, Go homie. home. Being the master shmup creator that you are, how would you address the flamethrower of Golden Bat? What would you do to it if you had your way? Mate, don't come in here through into my house through the ethernet cable and ask how i would change battle garaga that's come on man that's too Wait, much I'm, i ask the hard questions on this <laughs> podcast <laughs> this um, isn't the this isn't an easy magazine interview this is the hard stuff gosh i i make it bigger and and um 
I, actually, I, I don't like. Um, I generally don't like attacks that automatically aim at stuff, and the flamethrower is a particularly egregious example of that. I feel <laughs> if it maybe yeah. just shot like straight up ahead of you or in like a sort of cone formation, maybe it would be more tolerable. Then I don't know, but you can't ask a question like that. That's that. Yikes. I'm looking to the judges. They're 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 nodding their head. They accept more flames and no longer crappy auto aim. They agree. So okay, you win. But anyway, speaking of Garega and all these other things, how did you get into shmups in the first place? I had a kind of relatively poor childhood. I'm not you know I wasn't like eaten out of wooden bowls in the sector, but uh, you know I was single parent, working class, etc. And what do you do in the year like 2000 when you know your child your child has the game let's make no bones about it the, ch the kids got a game you don't have that much money so what do you do you get a dreamcast because that is the console which is incredibly easy to pirate games for and Hell that yeah. really that really like opened up a lot of games for me because suddenly i was able to play like all sorts of weird like japanese games or like the dreamcast was already like a a haven for like arcade ports and just stuff that you wouldn't really see again. Um, my first shooting game was Giga Wing, oh, then yeah. Mars Matrix, but I preferred Giga Wing. Um, Gunbird 2, that sort of thing. Eventually, you know, I would move on to kind of Windows games, uh, Chorin Sha, uh, the old Kentacho games like R Rootage, etc. I suppose it would be R Rutage. I don't know. Don't ask Toho me game. about Japanese pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> don't, um, don't take me down that road. <laughs> My like university degree was partially in computer science and partially in Imperishable Night, and then eventually I would move on to like. Was that a minor or major in Imperishable Night? I think the well, audience needs to know. Played on hard difficulty, so you can tell me. <laughs> I, I didn't play on Lunatic because uh, not really my kind of thing. Yeah, and then eventually I just got into like uh, your big boy stuff, your Cave Rising stuff, playing on Mame, etc. And then eventually getting console ports, etc. My first proper paycheck from a full-time job went towards a Japanese 360 to just to play uh, Ketsui, finally. Wow. So I've heard a lot of stories of how people got into shmups, but I'm going to say I think yours is my favorite about how you got a Dreamcast to pirate games with. That is a very... I don't, I love that story. <laughs> the story. <laughs> well, cool, I kind of wish that was my story, to be honest, a little bit. That's awesome. So... Dreamcast has quite a few awesome shmups, Mars Matrix, Giga Wing, like you say, uh, the Gumber 2 port. Is there a, a shmup on the Dreamcast that's even for like shmup players that maybe isn't quite on the radar that you considered really badass or that was really influential on you? On the Dreamcast? Um, man, if you had said the PlayStation, I would immediately say like Sandvein or something like that. I can't actually think of anything on the Dreamcast right now. C can I talk about Sandvein instead? Because that's, that's a pretty yeah, cool so game. You also got a PS1, it sounds like, at some point. No, I eventually just played that on an emulator when uh, I oh, was well, in 2015. So, <laughs> you know, that's not really such a romantic story. Sandvein is a really cool game, though. It's like a um, short kind of wave-based kind of game where you're moving through a dungeon. There is really the bones there of a game that could be really popular now. It could really work well with a lot of, like kind of roguelite mechanics or so on if you've got the taste Holy for that crap yeah so I like think a gun a enter the gungeon type game not i hate that a, i hate that not game, a but sure wait why do you <laughs> hate that game because i kind of i kind of see where you're coming from so i want to hear your your thoughts first um, my problem with basically every action roguelite is that the pacing sucks like i hate loops in shooting games i have a chronically short attention span i can play like for if it's like something that's hard and engaging 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And a lot of these games just seem like they drag on and on and on. Enter the Gungeon was one where I guess they patched this eventually, but just traversing the places was so just really time consuming. Another game which really suffers from this is Synthetic, which you might have seen. That's I haven't like, seen that one. That's like a road glide, but it's for like, there's a heavy emphasis on insane firearms, basically. And that again, that has just a really. It just drags on too long. Every zone just feels one floor too much. Yeah, I I think most of those those games are just far too long. I, How do you feel? I about completely it? I completely agree from that perspective too because I actually don't really like roguelikes all that much to just in general mm -hmm. because of that exact reason where you go in it's kind of like okay you grind out for like you say for an hour to get to okay now the game's getting really hot and then you die it's like okay well. 
It's like they're super long, but they're not. I know what you mean. A lot of people don't like multi loop games. Sometimes mm-hmm. I can kind of get into them, you know, like maybe Batsugun Special or something like that. But okay. I feel like, yeah, because my friend loves Enter the Gungeon, so he'll, we'll play it when he comes over. But yeah, the especially the first three or four floors, it just really drags, you know. It feels sometimes a little Euro shmuppy to me, if that if that's really mean to say. But Well, like everything takes too much damage. Or- everything takes too much damage. You don't really have a whole lot of firepower out the gate, and it, mm. it's just kind of like, you know, eating vegetables or something. It's not fun. The vegetables can be fun. How old are you? Be careful, it's a trap! It's impossible this way! You'll never defeat Andros! So what took you from going from playing shmups to, okay, let's let's start making these bad boys? Eventually, I, like, I've always been interested in making games, ever since, though not always uh, shooting games. Like, my first big brain concept I had in university was... Uh, this is basically a very cringeworthy concept, but Metroid with a timer. So you've got like 30 minutes of Metroid and then the game ends. That's awesome. But eventually I got started working in like, I started doing like game jams, etc. I made a few game jam games, including a game like got called Impoverished Starfighter, which was my attempt to like making a, a shooting game with a shop, like a kind of Eurosmop kind of thing. Oh, um, like a, it, in um, Fantasy Zone. Uh, yeah, like Fantasy Zone or like Forgotten Worlds or, you know, that kind of thing. UN Squadron? UN Squadron? Between the stages? There's a little shop, you buy stuff? Yes, the SNES game. I've not yes. played that. Um, so eventually I would uh, get to work with Woof on a game jam, who I knew through a mutual friend. Woof is our lead artist. Did a sort of prototype and then we didn't really know where to go from there. And I said, can we make a shooting game, please? It's probably really easy, haha. <laughs> um, and then, you know. That's 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 the direction we went in. Holy crap. Was that what em- eventually became Blue Revolver? Or were there like baby prototype shmups out there that... You know? Blue Revolver actually was a fairly straight line in its development, which is quite interesting. Like the version 0.1 demo that we put out af- like after a month wouldn't look too dissimilar from the final version of the game, which is funny. Like the art, the perspective of the art style has completely changed. Obviously, many of the mechanics got more fleshed out, but you know, it's the stuff is there. All the basic stuff is there. How long did Blue Revolver take to make? From I'll say, from initially sitting down and whatever program you're using, kind of laying out the outlines in the program to mm. basically released. Well, it was it was always released. an on and off sort of thing. I would say maybe like between one and two years working on and off. So, wow, yeah, that's pretty quick. Well, I'm used to. You know, Zero Ranger story where it's like a decade, basically. Oh, yeah. it's, so. it's hard to compare with Zero Ranger in many ways, especially dev time. But you know what? That's really cool to hear, actually, because I want to get your perspective on this. One thing that I always kind of breaks my heart a little bit about indie sh- indie games in general, mm-hmm. not even just indie shmups, is that Fight and Rage is a good example of this, actually, because I am I love this game. I'm, I've been playing it all day. Is that you'll find an indie shmup or an indie game that you really, really like and you always get that kind of feeling like they'll probably never make a sequel to this or they'll probably mm. never make this into a series. You know, this will be like the creator's one great, you know, shmup mm. or game. And because of the nature of assuming how much work and pressure and financial stress they're under, it doesn't ever become like a Mega Man type thing where you get Mega Man X, Mega Man X2, make, you know what I mean? And I would yeah. love to see indie games do that where you have like, a series of games rather than just one, like the Shovel Knight model. It's like Shovel Knight and then a bunch of DLC for Shovel Knight, but no Shovel Knight 2. <laughs> mm, mm. Uh, what do you yeah, think about there's that? A, there's a real tangible sense that there's no sustainability. There's like a few kind of big companies that can kind of do what I say companies, big, let's say big teams. There's like bridging the gap between like a proper, like a proper, like published game and indie where they can kind of be a little bit sustainable. But yeah, you, you just see it again and again and again. Like, I mean, what's the most famous shooting game on Steam is probably Jamestown, right? And you look at right. Jamestown and you say, well, what did those guys do after that? I mean, Jamestown, it's it's not an awful game. It's fine, I guess. Maybe I shouldn't be that cruel about Jamestown. It's a perfectly fine game. And it's like, where did you go from here? And 
I guess they just weren't able to, or they they were not interested. Maybe another really tragic thing is when you see like shmups in that early phase that they're gonna come out, and they just never come out. But you mm. have that like early stuff, and you're like, oh, finish it, damn it! Yeah, you just um, get this was, little glimpse of a, a thing that will never appear. There was some shmup that I saw really early on into my like podcasting and stuff like that that you pr- might know what it is i'll have to look it up it, it had a kickstarter it had kind of like this neo geo graphic sort of thing going on and i think they zydonia had, but... that's just the the kind of kickstarter project that i recall um a game called zydonia it's, it's a it's a horizontal I, I think that's it. it's that's it it is kinda it. Like yeah, a... zydonia it's a, like a vaguely kind of last resort vibe from some of these stages um yeah, I don't know if that eventually came out, but I, ju- that's I just it, that's remember. It. Yes, I just remember Zydonia. seeing it, and then what happened with this? I think I might have even played the demo at some point, but you know, I'm less passionate about horizontal games. I'll say that. Yeah, so being someone that has created what I consider an amazing top tier indie shmup, mm-hmm. I'd love to get your perspective on this issue that I'm talking about. Do you think it is possible for a game like Blue Revolver or Zero Ranger and these types of shmups to continue into the future in like a growing expense? Or do you feel like it's basically all comes down to how motivated you personally are and like how willing you are to grind your life away to make these games. Well, there's one thing that sh- which I'm probably going to keep returning to, which is that shooting games, they're still not going anywhere, right? There's still so many people that are passionate about them. They are easy enough to get started making. And even if you pour like everything you are into them, probably not going to bankrupt yourself. You know, it's there's not much in the way of costs like there would be for like, I don't know, a multiplayer game or something of, like, a lot of uh, 3D models, etc., these sorts of things, or voice acting, etc. So they're probably not going anywhere. But like I said, there is a there is a tangible lack of sustainability in the the entire indie world, not just shooting games. And also on top of that, shooting games have several innate disadvantages, which I'll probably move on to later in this uh, little talk. You know what I feel like, just from my outsider perspective, I feel like being an indie dev especially for shmups Mm -hmm. and being a YouTuber podcaster, especially for shmups is kind of a similar experience where you're putting hundreds and hundreds of hours of time into this basically out of passion and you do get some support, but it, it really just comes down to when you look at like the external world around you, this is all basically driven forward by your personal passion because there's not a lot of like outside sustainable factors that keep you going Mm. is that what it is like being an indie developer or is there a little bit more of a light at the end of the tunnel with that sort of thing the the whole indie scene is like a you're relying on a lot of black boxes you know a lot of things which uh are not really beholden to you at all you know steam aren't really going to help you get your game out there though they are obviously happy to take your money etc there's a few like honeymoon deals around going around right now, but there's still this kind of fundamental issue isn't really being addressed. Yeah, it's another black box in terms of putting your stuff out there. Will it work? Well, when a game is successful, we can all look back at it and go, oh, it's successful because of X, Y, and Z. And then when a game's not successful, we can go, oh, it wasn't successful because of X, Y, and Z. But there's always like a hundred examples where you can go, well, this game did that. It wasn't successful. Or this game sucks and it did so well. It's like playing the damn slot machines, man. It sounds exactly like being a YouTuber then. Because <laughs> that's how exactly it is too. Where, for instance, my biggest, most popular video on my channel is my arcade stick tutorial of how to like grip arcade sticks. I, I like the video a lot. But had I known 
it was going to be this massive video on my channel. I would have went like all in mm, on the productions yeah. and all this stuff. I have other videos on my channel that I was so sure this is going to pop off. This is going to be hot. Like my uh, shmup sagas where they're like three hours and they take like weeks to prepare for. They do like a little bit above average. So nowadays, whenever I upload a video, I just am now like, okay, the way to do this is just to create a vibe for each video, create a direction for each video, and just launch it. If it works, okay. If it doesn't, okay. And then we just move on to the next one. Launch, launch, and just try that method because besides all the algorithm stuff and all that. But yeah, that sounds like a very similar experience where when you're putting your shmup together, you're putting your game together, you're thinking, okay, this element could appeal to people, this element could appeal to people, but you actually have no idea. Yeah. I think that one of the reasons that teams can get so demotivated after putting something out there is that there's a real tangible sense of, oh, okay, we got really lucky here. Lightning isn't going to strike twice. How do we, oh, keep, how do we like keep going? The sh you think like the Shovel Knight thing where they're like, okay, let's just keep making yeah, DLC yeah. for Shovel Knight because... Th there's there's all sorts of mechanics in, in this industry which just reward you for kind of milking it is, you know, boss milk, I suppose, uh, just milking your existing stuff as long as you can and not really moving forward because it's a hit driven industry, isn't it? So, you know, one series that I do li like the model that does this and, you know, that there's shmup players that have not that favorable outlook on the series. And I don't actually don't know why, to be honest, but I kind of do like the Don Maku Unlimited 3 model where he's like, he made one. Mm -hmm. Then he made two. Two was better than one. Mm -hmm. Then he makes three, which is better than two. And hopefully he's making four, which will be, you know, better than three. So I'm like, I like this. It's like, okay, we're, we're improving. Each release is getting better and better and better. He's learning from each, you know, release. I, I really like that model, but I don't know if that's sustainable for most people to do that or if that's even like the best way to go about things in the environment. What do you think about that? Where would you ever consider Okay, you make blue revolver, you make double action. Would you make blue revolver three or would, how would you, how do you feel about that? I definitely want to advance the concepts in blue revolver, but in terms of the actual, like the, the lore and the characters, the, the kind of vibe, etc., that ultimately isn't as, that's not really up to me because I'm just the, you know, I'm just the programmer, right? I would definitely want to expand on these uh, kind of scoring mechanics, the kind of, um, well, in terms of design, in terms of like, bosses, bullet patterns, rank, etc. That stuff, I would love to iterate upon, but it's hard to say whether it would just be like Blue Revolver 2 or it would be something else, I don't know. Oh yeah, like, you could also do like the cave model, right? Where they have mm -hmm. like tons of different, but they all have that DNA of cave, but they have different stories, different settings, different systems, mm -hmm. but they have that underlying DNA. I also think that's really, really cool when developers do that as well. I don't really get out of bed and like scream in excitement at big like big gameplay ideas and gimmicks and so on i'm more of a iterative sort of person where i guess i'm like a one of them orcs from warhammer 40k right i take like five or ten of the games that i like i kind of mash them together in some sort of horrible machine and if it works it works via like self-denial force of will etc so i guess i'm an orc why wow. well, well i think that's really an underrated aspect of game creation and stuff like that is what you're talking about where you're refining things and sometimes when you look at games like Ikaruga and stuff like that people immediately attach to the big idea you mm. change your ship to match the bullets and stuff but then they have a hard time understanding oh what makes DOJ different from some other bullet hell well it's like well it's so refined the pieces are so well crafted and put together the stage design is perfect the you know the timing is so well done or you know so, yeah yet. and what I, separates... I, that shows in that shows in blue revolver a lot like okay. obvi it's obviously feels super polished or you know what separates like daiojo from daifukatsu or indeed those from side daiojo etc so so even within within cave's library there is iteration upon iteration yeah definitely so we're on the topic of game design. I want to ask mm -hmm. you, because I want you to give your perspective for a lot of people listening. You know, there are a lot of people who listen to my podcast and stuff who are aspiring developers are like developing a game right now and stuff mm -hmm. like that. 
And I think you'd be a great person to give advice on this topic because I think Blue Revolver, when you play it, and I've talked to Japanese players and stuff, it feels so, it's hard to explain, but it, like I said, so polished. So you could see, like if you are just uh, slapped some Japanese studio's name on it, oh, you know, this guy used to work at Cave and now he made this indie shmup. You could believe it. Like, it feels very genuinely, I don't know how to say it, but basically, how do you avoid Euro shmup territory for people? How do you avoid the things that a lot of people who are getting into shmup development kind of go down this path and then it ends up being pretty awful as far as, like we talked a little bit earlier, like way too much health or way underpowered, all those types of things. What are your personal ways of going about that? It's interesting you talk about the the kind of um, the way it feels because when I, I remember very specifically when I was seeing reading like Japanese correspondence about our game, one word that I kept seeing again and again on Google Translate was the word orthodox, and it was like, wait, does that mean like boring? What does that mean? Does that mean oh, it's just another? But no, it's like this is the kind of game that you would expect. This this feels like right. This is like it's what you would expect. It's hard to find a word for that. So mm-hmm. orthodox to our English ears doesn't quite sound right. Yeah, it sounds. But if you say really if you say genuine or legitimate, it sounds a little too elitist. But yeah, it's like, it feels sounds genuine. Kind of, sounds like you're being a bit genuine. of a like a hipster, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yes. It's if, real, man. It's real. I don't know what the word for it is. I'll have to find some yeah, word for but, it. But you know, we 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 both know what we're talking about, which is nice. In terms of not following to, falling into the kind of Euro shmup abyss, being a player, I'm not really. I consider myself more as a more of a player than a designer. I don't really like thinking of ideas in like uh, isolation. I'm interested in games, not ideas. I'm not a particularly good player. It took me years on years to do a one cc to do a one all of Ketsui, um, and I'm still but chasing you got the multi loop. And I got it in the end. Um, but you got it. Yeah, I got it. Okay. And I'm still chasing Omote Loop, etc. And maybe I'll never get it in my lifetime. Who knows? But I have played, like, lots of shooting games. I used to hang out on, um, you know, Lord BBH, if you're aware of him. Yes. He's like a streamer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I used to be a big fan of hanging out on his stream when it was conducive to my schedule. And any time a shooting game would appear, I would just say, I've played this game. And I would only be lying, like, 10% of the time. Really. <laughs> That's a good percentage. Yeah, yeah, it's like a yeah. Um, That's respectable. So from all this, you can you can kind of crystallize a decent idea of what players tend to expect. You know, you've got your focus fire, you've got your, your rapid fire, you've got bombs, etc. How does a bomb feel? How does a bomb look? How does a bomb behave? And you have a lot of knowledge on where certain ideas and concepts have been tried before, and then you can go and refer to those. So obvious example, right? If you are talking about ooh a polarity switching mechanic, right? Yes. Where, you know, the bullets change colors, player changes colors, then obviously the first place you're going to look to is naturally Daimahu by Rising. They did it first. Yeah, when, when you were leading into this, I was thinking, <laughs> oh, Daimahu, that, that's the game. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have... Or there's the... some, I think there's some Toho bootleg that does this too. If I, uh... if I really think about it, there was some sort of Toho bootleg that does well, that. Well, particularly if you're looking at the Dojin scene, um, then, <laughs> like, there is literally nothing new under the sun. People love to say, oh, what about a shooting game where you self destruct and it makes chains of explosions? Yeah, every extend, mate. Heard it. Move on. What about what a shooting about, game uh, where you What about like, a shmup bullets, where you're on a motorcycle? I want to find that. Is there a uh, shmup where you're on a motorcycle? That? Oh, what's that game called? It's like a top down. It's not really a. But it's, it's a top down I... kind of. It's a top down run and gun game, and it had a motorcycle level, which is. Stupid. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. Maybe someone in chat will, will tell us when this eventually goes live on Twitch, and I'll be there to say, "Damn, you're right." Uh... <laughs> You've had a month to think about it. You, you're prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you have it locked and loaded. So yeah, uh, having like this encyclopedia of games in your brain, and especially if you can actually recall their names, which helps you have a sense of what players expect, which is which just gives you such an advantage. If you don't have that, then you suddenly have to tutorialize absolutely everything, which just sucks. Yeah, and I also think that shmups are very... This is my very elitist, but this is shmups lamb, so if I can't be elitist here, where can I be? Mm-hmm. I just feel like shmups are 
generally a lot better than all the other genres out there because they have <laughs> this they have this sort of evolution of game design that carries across games, you know, and like I'll give you an example. Like for instance, they make Super Mario Bros a platformer and then they make the lost levels, which is like the harder, more hardcore version, and mm -hmm. everyone's like, whoa, whoa, tone this shit down. We need to we need this to, you know, be nice and easy. So then they kind of go back, okay. But Shmups didn't do that. They're like, okay, we did lost levels. Now we're just gonna keep going and just keep going and keep pushing. And developers and the players have this relationship where you know what I mean? There's like this arms yeah, race definitely. between them. Like, that doesn't happen in other genres. It's not like they're making a new Mario game and they're like, okay, who, what are the best Mario players around? Here, play this. Can you beat this? Or shmups are just so unique in that way that I feel like the genre evolves along with the players and that's why you get these insane games. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of things which are like really quite unique to shooting games as well. The unique mechanics like I don't know, smart bombs, etc. And also shooting games, they're probably like the last bastion, if there is a bastion, of high score play. Where, you know, if other games do this, it's via like speedruns, etc. High score play is a different thing, obviously. You've maybe got a few beat em ups or right. know, pinball tables, etc. And you yeah. see other games that they kind of dabble in scoring systems, and there's a real sense they haven't even learned a tenth or a hundredth of what shooting games have forgotten. You know, you've got all these problems which they figured this out. Japanese salary men smoking <laughs> fifty cigarettes a day, they figured this stuff out, man. You just can just look at that. But no, we have to keep oh a combo meter. This is so cool. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, where I've been starting to I'm going to make a video on this maybe before this podcast comes out about score play versus speed running and how there's so many similarities, but also differences mm. and how, yeah, like there's certain concepts that you learn in a shmup that give you advantages for when you play other games for, for score. For instance, I got a world record. I'm doing air quotes and turtles in time. I beat the twin galaxies world record air quotes mm -hmm. because I knew, okay, let me just milk this boss pattern for two hours, which mm. I did. You know, it's like, and you know when they're making a beat em up or they're making these games or like you're saying, they're kind of just throwing in these ideas of, oh, let's just add a score counter at the top, whatever. You kill a guy, it's worth three points. And they don't sit there and think, well, we have this infinitely regenerating boss pattern where you can kill the enemies into the, just milk it and basically keep milking it as long as you want. Mm. Yeah, these concepts don't usually, like a lot of games that try and add scoring elements, they're not. They're not watching out for these types of things, like yeah. like you were saying, like oh shit, they can just milk this boss for two hours and e counter stop or something. <laughs> yeah, and even in arcade land, I feel like shooting games are still like the the best examples of high score play for various reasons. Like if you go to let's say Metal Slug and you go, okay, I'm gonna play Metal Slug for score. Yeah. Uh, oh my god. Good, <laughs> good <laughs> luck, man. I here's your packed lunch. Here's your packed dinner. Here's your packed breakfast because you're still gonna be playing that in the morning yeah they're like um, two hour runs to get is, with all the milking it's ridiculous if you're playing metal slug 2 then it's two hours of a game that is running at 10 percent speed it is insane oh i don't like i can't even imagine metal slug 3 either oh god that game is already too long yeah but even if you speed ran that game it would still <laughs> take you like it'd still take you like like watching lord of the rings yeah, I talked about this before. Metal Slug Three, I think, is insanely overrated, yes, and it kind of yes, shows. Yes, and it kind of shows what people value, like outside people value in a in a game. And you're like, what are you talking about? Metal Slug Three is probably the worst Metal Slug. Metal Slug X is way way better than Metal Slug Three. Definitely. But... Oh, I'm I'm I like the first one the best. I think. Uh, yeah, Metal but... Slug One is I think is the best too. 
Metal Slug X and Metal Slug 1, I always think, are the, the best. Actually, I like those a lot. I do have a soft spot for 4 and 5, even though they are still filled with so much fluff. But, you know, they've got cool things like the slide, I suppose, and the double, the double These are gun. kind of <laughs> cute. You got yeah, the dual yeah. wield. Yeah. These are all kind of cute, at least. Yeah, and you know what's f- a little fun fact about Metal Slug 1 that isn't in the other Metal Slug games that I've found? Is mm-hmm. that you can short hop in Metal Slug 1 okay. for some reason. It's actually pretty useful. So in a, most Metal Slugs, you have like that huge, really big massive, floaty jump. Floaty yeah. jump. Metal Slug One, you can short hop if you quick tap jump. You'll do a little hop. It's pretty useful. I played the other Metal Slugs. I'm like, where'd the short hop go? Oh yeah, yeah. Hmm. Metal Slug One, I actually is one of my very first uploads on this channel. If you guys go back in my history and keep scroll, and it's like one of the first videos is my Metal Slug One CC. Like I say, like even in the arcade scene. People are dealing with all of these uh, problems of scoring mechanics that shooting games just figured out or just didn't have to deal with for certain reasons. Like, have you ever seen a, a scoring run of Robocop, for example, the Data East game, where you're just milking <laughs> no, something that's off? You're milking something that's off screen, then you don't even have to press a button. Like, you just you just watch the score meter just keep going up, etc. Anyway, you know, it'd be another interesting genre to look into scoring with, which I'm going to be doing soonish. Mm-hmm. Is light gun games. Okay. So, yeah, like, um, have you ever played Vampire Knight? That's a Lycan game on the PS2. Uh, I feel like Lycan games, you know, there's a lot of potential there because there are scoring systems and mm-hmm. you do have to have skill to, t- yeah. to take advantage of the scoring systems. And, like, what's crazy about some Lycan games like Vampire Knight is you're also scored based on your accuracy ranking. Mm-hmm. So if you could be, the skill ceiling could be extremely high where you have to shoot all this stuff and not miss. And then also, like, kill all the extra things you need to? I mean... Yeah, that is actually really interesting, because, I mean, there's, there's definite similarities. They're like, like gun games, they are, quote, auto-scrollers. They go at their own yep. pace instead of the players, you know? Um, you've got a... There's a, like, you've got defensive play and offensive play, where you're, like, shooting down the axes that zombies throw at you or whatever. And then you can yep. go on to that and say, like, what about scoring play in Typing of the Dead or something funny like that? That would be <laughs> yeah. interesting. 200 words per minute. <laughs> maybe if you, maybe you like get like a multiplier if you properly punctuate everything. You know what's funny is, uh, did you, were you required to take typing classes in public school? In, I don't know in Europe uh, how that works. I was like seen as a, a special case in primary school and I was like kind of taught a little bit of touch typing, etc. And I was, I was the only one that got to go to the library in the next village, which is kind of weird to think about in retrospect, <laughs> but it was cool, I suppose. Um, like you're gifted you can go to where the books are <laughs> pretty much yeah it was kind of it was, a, it was a mining village it was no fun but no there was there was no real like formal typing lessons etc i feel like we might have a little bit similar backgrounds so, you know i grew up in the middle of nowhere in idaho mm-hmm. so yeah you know farm country and stuff and uh typing was like the thing probably the most useful thing i learned in school one of the most useful things mm. anyway so the typing classes had rudimentary typing games and everyone else in the class was, you know, mostly like flirting and goofing off and stuff. And I'd do that from time to time. But I was also prided myself on being the fastest, best, highest scoring typist in the class. I was like, <laughs> aiming for 150 per minute and stuff like that. Everyone's that like... One of my favorite classes in school, which I don't think is... Maybe that's like a little bit of a precursor to, okay, this guy might like arcade shmups and stuff and that sort of thing because i used to sit there in class and grind out try grind out high scores in typing class that's sick like everyone else is <laughs> like building these blossoming relationships that last them the entirety of their lives and you're there typing like sphinx of black quartz judge my vote <laughs> listening to rick james typing away yeah hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> well anyway that just brought to my mind because you're talking about typing of the dead <laughs> so you said it only took about two years to put blue revolver together which is impressive to me for sure what was kind of the design philosophy going into blue revolver like how did it come together in your mind and how did it come together in the computer so when i was in university and i started looking at shooting game design i had a concept which was called the flourish concept where you have these short chains and then at the end of them you've got like a big kind of decisive action at the end of each of them to kind of cash in and this of course partially informed by games like ketsu and the thing I kept around with was basically like a melee mechanic, but those are so, so hard to get right in shooting games. Yes. Unless yes. you are 
Dragon Blaze and you have Ian the Necromancer in your corner. I find it so hilarious to call a necromancer Ian. I don't know. Well, maybe that's just me. Um, but anyway, <laughs> sounds like a nice co- Celtic name or something like that. I guess <laughs> is that a Celtic? Name? I, don't know. I don't know. I'm from Idaho. You think I know that stuff? I don't just know. Ian, like, it's like me. Ian is not. A, <laughs> Ian is the name of that Forgotten Weapons guy, and he's pretty cool. Maybe he's a necromancer. Anyway, I have yeah. So there was that, and then when it came time to make a kind of game, we I just said, you know what. I'm going to make a clone of Moochie Moochie Pork with a little bit of Cyvern, because I think those are both like super underrated games. They're not perfect, but they're underrated and pretty overlooked. How do you feel about the port? For uh, Moochie? On the 360, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm It's kind not, of meh, right? I'm not really a big like stickler for like technical details in terms of like slowdown, etc. I find it so hard to notice those, I'll be honest. Oh. Which is maybe not a good thing to, <laughs> to admit. But the presentation well, that, of it certainly felt a bit weird, and you know, it's not like I had a, a PCB to compare with, right? So yeah, I just wonder if those games would, I mean, among shmup players, not among the world, mm. but among shmup players, if the the ports were a little better, I wonder if they might be a little bit more popular. Maybe, like the maybe M2 bundling style it, port. Um, maybe bundling Moochie Pork with Pink Sweets was not the greatest marketing strategy because it's like. Well, we know how a lot of people feel about Pink Sweets. It's either like the best game ever, if you like Plasmo, or... <laughs> yes, or Pearl. Uh, irredeemable f- garbage if you're most other people. <laughs> Though that's not how I feel about Pink Sweets, obviously. It's a I very gotta, special game. I gotta put more time on, you know, on it, to be honest. Mm, yeah, everyone does. And uh, Suicide Club, I believe, is what that ROM hack was called. That is really cool. I love the ROM hacks and stuff like that. But yes. anyway, go ahead. So I worked the flourish concept into that, and then I started looking at like boss scoring mechanics, which have always been at, like a, a little bit thin on the ground. I feel so I came up with like I looked at like Raiden Fighter series and Battle Garaga, and that's where I came up with like break bonuses. So there was that the rank system, actually not influenced by shooting games. That was just God Hand. I was just going, hey, hey, God Hand, that was a game. Let's have a nice. bit of God Hand. You know what's funny is before this comes out, I'll probably have a God Hand video on my channel. Really? Uh, that's fucking yeah. sick. Because that's one of those games. I love 3D beat em whatever you call them, 3D beat em ups, character action games. Character action games and, is what I would call them, yeah. I love how it was uh, on and stuff like that. And I'm sure like, yeah, there's going to be a really juicy video about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe these days there is more of a case to be made for Imagine Party Babies um, in comparison but yeah god hand is just uh it's it's a f- game you can say that it's a f- game <laughs> so yeah and there was also like thinking about games like espagluda which are good at giving like the players multiple options for dealing with situations where you're like okay i can have like a i can use like a big bomb i can use like a small bomb or i can spend my kakuse i can like rank up etc 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 so in the end i just really wanted to make like a stepping stone shooting game with a fairly kind of lenient system and economy, which would in turn make people want to play more shooting games. I don't know how successful that was, but if you end up with something that people like, then I suppose that's good enough. I remember last year or so, I was doing a lot of putting together lists of recommended games to help you get into the genre. Mm -hmm. And I had like based on your platform and on that list for sure was Blue Revolver. If you're a PC player, I was like, yeah, get Blue Revolver. It definitely is really good about that. Yeah. Like getting you into bullet hell, getting you into shmups. I think I saw the video of yours, which was like the best beginner shmup ever, which was uh, Imperishable Night. And I was like, yeah, this guy, he gets it. Because (laughs) hell yeah. Imperishable Night is such a, it's a very forgiving game, but it's still good at like teaching bomb sense. And it's, it's just a nice game. It's just a nice game. And it's got spell practice. It's got all these little tools you can use. It's, yeah, I know. I remember making that video. I'm like, okay, how many people am I going to piss off choosing a Toho game? But hey, if you look at the evidence, and there is actual evidence from me, at least personally, like I keep track of this when I interview people and stuff, a lot of people come in through Toho. Then I was like, okay, Toho has something, there's something there. Like mm-hmm. Toho has something there that gets people into this genre. You interview all the recent super players, Kiwi, Moglar, all these guys. They all are starting in Toho. I'm like, okay, what is it besides just discoverability? And then I was, you know, playing music. a lot of Imperishable Night and the music. Like, it has everything. Like you said, it has replay functions. It has stage select. 
practices. Yeah. You can practice all this different stuff. And then the pacing of the game kind of helps you learn all these kind of deeper mechanics that are a little less hard to figure out in like DOJ where it's just murdering you in the first second. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. or the first stage or two. So yeah, I definitely stand by that as well. I think Imperishable Night is a great way to get into the genre. Uh, I, I quite like the Toho kind of structure and pacing of the stages where, you know, you've got the first three stages, which are a nice kind of sedate introduction. And then you've got stage four where it's like, okay, this shit's getting real okay. now. Then you've okay, got stage five, which is full of gimmick, which is full of gimmicks. And then you've got stage six, which is really short, but it's like, okay, one last push and I can beat Rebelia or Kaguya, whatever their names are, etc. Yeah. So was uh, Toho a big influence on you? Be- no. I- okay. Because I was going to say like, Maybe with the like boss stuff, like, I, maybe I could see that, right? Like yeah, giving the, the patterns, boss stuff. like giving patterns names, is was a really good idea, and it wasn't actually inspired by Toho, even though that's obviously like they did it and they did it really well. There's like a part of every game I've played, basically in in what I produce, and like I say, Imperishable Night was a very crucial game for me, uh, growing up and advancing. Well, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, because I remember you, I think you told told me about this, I asked you about it a while ago, was the hitbox design in Blue Revolver. And I was compliment, complimenting you on how much I love the hitbox design in the game because it feels so polished. It feels like, okay, these hitboxes make sense. And when you, you know, it's not like Gunbird where the hitbox is in their head or the bullet hitboxes are mm. bizarre. Even Cave has some jank hitboxes, like those in Donampachi, it has those like rectangular bullets that the tank shoots out in stage two and stuff it's like the hitboxes are they have like these huge hitboxes in the back of them and stuff like that and so and i remember you telling me so i guess for the people listening what was the way you put together the hitboxes in blue revolver (laughs) um oh this is an uncomfortable question because oh i'm gonna gonna lay down some ground truths yeah we're getting down to brass tacks right now (laughs) nuts and bolts Every blue, every blue revolver hitbox is the same size. All of the enemy bullets are the same hitbox, two by two, the same as the player. It's sixty hertz collision detection. There's no tunneling in the collision detection. It's literally as forgiving as it can possibly be without being stupid, which is, I think, where you should shoot for for collision in a shooting game. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't do that. Just as forgiving as possible without being stupid. Whatever you're doing. It's definitely working because, yeah, that's exactly how it feels. Because there have been shmups I've played that have really forgiving, really forgiving hitboxes that feel almost bizarre. Like, have you ever played Ten and Till? I have not, though. I really want to. It's this indie shmup, and some of the bullets, your hitbox is literally a pixel, and some Mm -hmm. of the bullets' hitboxes are just pixels. Mm. But, like, their sprites are, like, massive, but they have this tiny little pushing bullet held to the next level where you're just phasing through walls of bullets all the time but then it got to the point where it felt a little it felt silly i was like okay this is getting a little much when you're just flying through bullets like they don't even exist at this point yeah when Um, you have like this is just a a kind of technical point but when you do have stuff that when you do have hitboxes that are just literal pixels like one pixel or point in 2d space which isn't even a pixel it's just a set of coordinates then you do start to run into problems with uh, tunneling or what you might call um, undersampling in the collision detection. Where, let's say, let's think of maybe I'm getting off topic here, but let's say I'm wildly no, you're on topic. Them, right? I someone. want to hear about this. And there's two tunnels, right? And one tunnel is on my left, one tunnel is on my right, and I'm watching for Roadrunner coming through here on a train, let's say. Well, mm-hmm. I suppose that's not what Roadrunner does, but you know, if that goes fast enough, and if the frame rate of Wiley Coyote is low enough, then you won't see it at all, right? So if I'm thinking in collision detection, if a bullet is on my left and then the next frame it's on my right, then unless your collision detection specifically accounts for that via like tunneling, then there just won't be any collision. And that's, I think, why collision might feel a little bit inconsistent in a game like that. Though I've not played it, yeah, so I can't it- really comment. For people listening, if y'all want to check it out, it's a great game and it seems to work better in the later stages. But in the earlier stages, it does feel like you're just phasing through bullets. It's like, okay, where it messes with your head a little bit, but that, mm. that's crazy. So if, if you set that up incorrectly, you can just phase through the bullet in some 
Yeah, I mean, you, this happens like. in this happens in Blue Revolver as well sometimes, but I guess it's fine if people are fine with it. Like I say, as forgiving as possible without people coming away from it saying this is stupid. It's 60 hertz collision detection, which is I've been told by many insider sources that some cave games run at 30 hertz, which is insane to me. So that means is that more phasing through bullets or yes, less? If more phasing 30. through bullets. Yeah, so their collision bullets. detection works runs at 30 frames per second. Whereas the game itself is running at 60, if that makes right, sense. Right, so the bullet could just... If you, like, clip the bullet just right, you could just go right through it. Yes. Obviously, you can't really rely on that, you know, but it's... <laughs> right. You'll just go, like, oh, I, sh I should be dead. But, you know, it's... The way I feel about shooting games, like, it's fine for, like, a false a false uh, negative every so often. Where it's like, oh, I should have died there, but I guess God yeah. smelled on me this time. That's yes. way better than a false positive, which is like, what the f*** hit me there, bro? <laughs> yes. What hit me, bro? Yeah, invisible bullet from time to time. It's yeah, like, yeah. oh. <laughs> or like, oh, I guess like one pixel of my hitbox just sticking out. It was doing the stanky leg or whatever. Speaking of frame rates, I really want to get your insight into this as well. What do you think about in the future, especially as monitor technology is getting better and we're moving towards higher frame rates, mm -hmm. that shmups start moving into higher frame rates too? This because... Speaking of what we were talking about, Enter the Gungeon, one cool mm -hmm. thing about it, though, is you can run that bad boy in 144. Mm. And I have to say, it, is, it does feel pretty awesome to have the game running that fast. Yeah, um, actually, you... one of the things that Double Action will have when it is eventually released is a 120 hertz hack. Hell yeah, so that's you... what I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, in terms of what you actually get from that, from my experience... It's not as light and day as a game that where we've got like a free floating camera, like a first person shooter or a or like into the gungeon, I suppose. It's not as good as that. It's not like a night and day kind of oh but if you if you're looking at like really fast bullets or like the player shot, etc., these sorts of things, then it definitely makes a difference. I yeah. don't think it's something that games urgently need to pursue, personally. Maybe if you're doing like a really fast kind of, I don't know, a secure type of game, it would be really cool. I think it'll cut down on your input lag too, won't it? Running the game 120? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I love getting that input lag down nice and low. And then putting in like free sync, if you're able to do free sync on your monitors and stuff, which I do. Mm -hmm. And that makes a huge difference, especially the higher frame rates you go. But even at 60 FPS, I have a, uh, well, G sync actually. It makes a difference. Really cool. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Though these things, Changing the frame rate is pretty much always going to have an in an effect on the simulation. In Blue Revolver, that means that some weapons might deal slightly more damage, slightly less damage, etc. These sorts of things. Slight some timings might be a little bit off. People like to call this out for being like sloppy programming, but it's not something that's you can just do something and then it's just always like not a problem. Quake, right? One of the games that people is like, oh, that's one of the best programmed games of all time. If you f up the uh, the, the frame rate frame rate or the host rate <laughs> etc in, in like some quake engines then elevators start killing you it becomes a nightmare <laughs> yeah I, I do understand too that if you basically if you code your game like game maker i know this like if you mm -hmm. code your game certain ways and certain timers to work at 60 fps and then you bump your speed up to 120 guy yeah, like all your timers are now way off and yeah, enemy yeah. ai is getting funky and all kinds of ver things are spawning too early so, yeah, so I guess so what would in, be a way to deal with that, you know, especially since you're doing it with Blue Revolver? Well, like how in, would you compensate for that? Honestly, in double action, it's just gonna be like, this is a hack. It's just basically a like a little extra feature. If you've got a nice monitor, then that's great. You can play around with this. It disables replays, it disables um leaderboards, etc. So it's not really considered legitimate because we can't really tell without NASA. Uh, knowing all of <laughs> the minute gameplay differences that would result. So yeah. if you're playing like competitively, you're playing on 60, right? But if you're just playing casually, you can bump up to 120 and see the difference. Or I open the 120 leaderboard. <laughs> I suppose that's 120 a, that's only. Me, that's me one and approach. one other guy. <laughs> <laughs> me, because I'm I've got a nice. I monitor. wonder if we we can maybe get Kiwi to do it. Does Kiwi have a nice monitor? I sense that he does. I guess he can tell us in the chat in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I sense that he has the capability. Kiwi likes, uh, he probably likes Fortnite being 
as young as he is. So, you know, <laughs> he's secretly playing Fortnite on his 144 <laughs> FPS monitor. He could put some blue revolver on there. So, yeah, it, it's, um, it's not as life changing as it is in first person shooters or just any game with a free fo- with a free camera. But right. there's a, there's certainly a difference and it's cool to see. Yeah. And I wonder at what point do you think? I don't know. It's hard to say. You might have more insight on this than not. Do you think we're ever just as a gaming community or whatever it is, gamers, do you think that we're just going to move to 120 as a standard at some point or is 60 here to stay? I can't really speak on that. I mean, 60 is derived from a lot of things that were just, that's how things were when games started to come out. That's just how televisions worked. That's just how displays worked. You know, old consoles, they were mostly 60 hertz, I believe, apart from handhelds, etc. Though I am speaking from a small position of ignorance here at the very least. So I can't really say. It doesn't seem like 60 hertz is going away and that 120 hertz is like an enthusiast thing at most. Yeah, I would love that to... Interesting though with shmups though, because once you move into the 120 frame rate, right, you're kind of locking out of CRTs for the most part. CRTs are just magic boxes to me, I couldn't possibly (laughs) say, but if you say I believe it. What's crazy is some CRT monitors you can overclock. These have to be the computer monitors, not like the consumer TVs. You can overclock them to 120 FPS. I I did that for a bit. It was pretty cool. So you can get 120 FPS on a a CRT, but it's kind of like a weird yeah. I mean, like like weird say, thing to do. You're talking about like computer monitors at this point, which are not what goes in like an Astro City or you yes, know, yeah. This, the types of CRTs that people in the arcade would be thinking of. At one point, I want to make a uh, my own custom cab that has that giant 1080p CRT that they John made, Carmack like, uses. Yes, yes. Shove that thing into my own like custom cab, and then play PC games and you know emulated mate, games and stuff mate, on that. That thing will that fall through s- the f-ing floor. You'll need like had the way that a gun safe has to be like reinforced to the f-ing foundation of the house. That shit will fall through. the f-ing air will be that heavy well you know what's crazy is right now in my recording shed i'm sitting next to like a massive crt that's probably bigger than that already Uh, i have this giant i'm a crt junkie but yeah it'll be like that arcade cabinet is not going anywhere (laughs) (laughs) yeah like you said maybe i'll make it out of like a gun safe or some shit it won't be cool looking it won't be like oh you come over to my house and it's all pretty it'll look crazy but i think it'll be pretty cool it's a funny thought to um, <laughs> that someone might come around and steal it, and the way you'd know is that there's a forklift coming into your house. <laughs> yeah.